Yes, 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 okay. Uh, namaste, Assalamualaikum, Selamat pagi, good morning everybody. Welcome to the third and last day of the conference. Before I hand over to uh, Debanjan Chakrabarti, who's going to chair this session, I'd just like to make uh, four quick announcements, please. Three announcements for everybody. One announcement is specially for the presenters. Uh, the first announcement is that the first featured speaker session by Gita Durerajan, which was planned to be held here at 10.15, has had to be cancelled because, unfortunately, Gita has had to uh, hurry home because her sister is ill. Um, secondly, can you um, have a quick look at the program for today? You'll see that the, the design of the, of the program is slightly different today. There is no afternoon break um, so that we can uh, leave at the end of the day a bit earlier than uh, the first and second days. Uh, the third uh, reminder is please, 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 can you fill in your daily uh, research agenda thoughts and action agenda thoughts. I haven't had many responses yet. We really need these. Um, someone has suggested that we should make this available uh, in a digital format and we will be reminding everybody by email on Monday that if you haven't yet filled this in, please, please do so. It's really important for us to move on to the next stage. Uh, and then my, my last uh, announcement is, is for presenters, plenary presenters, featured speakers, parallel speakers, everybody else who has contributed to the program. Uh, please remember that we need the written up version of your paper by the end of January at the absolute latest. And in the notes for speakers, which we circulated a, a few weeks ago and which I hope you've read, um, we said there that we'd really appreciate it if in uh, the writing up of your presentation you could in some way reflect the feedback that you've received during the conference and other ideas that you've uh, come into contact during the conference so that your, your written up paper uh, reflects something of what's been happening over these three days. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll write to you again um, very soon uh, with a bit more detail about how we'd like the, the written-up version of the papers. Thanks very much. So I'll hand over now to uh, Dibanjan. Good morning, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you James Simpson. One of the things that uh, we discussed on day one, uh, Rob Lyons in his opening address mentioned that there are over 300 languages uh, being spoken in London schools. And against that backdrop, um, James will be talking about translanguaging in the contact zone, language use in super diverse urban areas. James is a senior lecturer in language education at the University of Leeds where he researches language learning and migration. James um, is also on Twitter, so uh, we mentioned that this is being covered extensively on social media, so James's Twitter handle is at Jeb Sim, at J-E-B-S-I-M, at Jeb Sim. Uh, James has also worked, uh, done some preliminary work in Gujarat looking at language uh, use and technology for um, disadvantaged social groups. James Simpson. Good morning. My um, perspective on this topic of Translanguaging in the contact zone, language use in super diverse urban areas, uh, is informed by my background as uh, a teacher of English, um, principally in migration contexts, that is to say, uh, a teacher of adult uh, migrants to the UK, and later somebody who's been researching this area. So, uh, my 
I'm informed in my, by my experience as a, as a teacher and a, and a researcher. And as Dibanjan said, I've also done some work in, in, in Gujarat looking at uh, um, the use of new technology amongst uh, disadvantaged social groups. Um, in the work and in the research and in the teaching, uh, I've had a sense, of, well, two, two things. Firstly, from uh, a teaching perspective, I am very aware that what happens in classrooms and what uh, teachers seem to know about language, the language use of their students, is um, rather different and perhaps not as complete as it might be, but it's rather different from the actual language use that goes on in the, uh, in, in the world outside the classroom walls. And I'm very struck by contemporary interaction and the way that it often involves movement communicating across languages. And I'm going to start with a short, a small example, one that I'll come back to. Um, and this is from our current research uh, in Leeds. Um, and this is a, uh, uh, a Czech-speaking mother living in Leeds in, in the UK with her, her family, communicating with her daughter on uh, SMS using WhatsApp. Uh, so a variety of uh, influences here in this interaction. Uh, hi, honey, would you like to come home for a bacon sandwich? So using, using Czech, using English, and using e emojis, using these uh, uh, emoticons, uh, which are familiar to everyone from, um, uh, from social media. So moving across languages, moving across semiotic systems, seems to be a very sort of normal and everyday thing. And that's not necessarily reflected in, in, in practice. It's not necessarily reflected in policy. And that's, um, that's where I'll, I'll sort of begin. And the outline of my, uh, my talk today uh, is there on the, on the screen. I'll talk uh, a little bit about the notion of super diversity, which is uh, um, a very central concept, I think, for uh, sociolinguists uh, right now. Um, I will go on to describe a super diverse urban environment, one in which I'm working. Uh, explain what I mean by the sociolinguistic contact zone um, and exemplify interaction in the contact zone with uh, some examples from, uh, from the data that uh, we're, we're looking at uh, in our current work in, in the UK. And I'll finish by um, talking about policy responses to the uh, the realities of contemporary multilingualism. And I'm going to end with a series of questions. I'll, I'll, I'll set up a, 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 the, the discussion bit at the end with, with a few questions, which will invite you to uh, think about implications for other contexts uh, in, and also implications uh, for the work in uh, domains beyond, uh, beyond education. So starting with the notion of super diversity, um, the reality of contemporary multilingualism is very familiar to everybody here. I'm working on a big project right now studying contemporary multilingualism in the UK. It's funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Uh, the title is Translation and Translanguaging, Investigating Linguistic and Cultural Transformations in Superdiverse Wards in Four UK Cities. It's a bit of a mouthful, so I'll call it T-Lang for short. Um, in Tlang, in the Tlang project, we're looking at language practices over time in public uh, spaces, in workspaces, in personal and private settings in four UK cities, in Birmingham, Cardiff, London and Leeds, and I'm working on the Leeds part of the project. Uh, our aim is to understand how people communicate multilingually across diverse languages and cultures. And our central research question uh, is how does communication occur or how does communication fail when people bring different histories and different languages into contact? So turning to uh, super diversity. Our team, the Leeds Tlang team, are carrying out most of the field work in an area called Hare Hills. It's just about a mile from 
the city centre of Leeds. It's an inner city area, it's uh, very diverse, it's uh, a very interesting place. And we characterise the area as super diverse, along with um, uh, many uh, sociolinguists today who are interested in, in mobility. The term superdiversity, the term was coined by the sociologist Stephen Vertovec, uh, but it's been taken up in a big way by sociolinguists of mobility, sociolinguists who are interested in language and movement. And uh, Jan Blomart and Ben Rampton are two such people, and this quote is from Blomart and Rampton's work back in 2011. They talk about a growing awareness that over the past two decades, globalization has altered the face of social, cultural, and linguistic diversity in societies all over the world. Or well, you could say that uh, social and cultural diversity is part of globalization, maybe. Uh, the multiculturalism of an er er earlier era has gradually been replaced by super diversity, characterized by a tremendous increase in the categories of migrants, not only in terms of nationality, ethnicity, language, and religion, but also in terms of motives, patterns, and itineraries of migration, processes of insertion into the labor and housing markets of host societies, and so on. And this is the important bit here, I think. The predictability of the category migrant has disappeared. And we can see this in this particular area of Leeds, which we're looking at. And um, migration was characterized uh, in earlier years uh, in, as, as, as being, in some sense, waves of migration. And that will be familiar to some of you, the idea of waves of migration from particular places. So in the mid-19th century, Hare Hill saw a lot of people coming in from Ireland, people who were escaping the potato famine in Ireland, but who are also coming to find work in the newly industrializing cities of the north of England. Uh, likewise, uh, in the late 19th century, uh, Jewish settlement from people who were escaping persecution in their home countries in, in Central Europe, and again coming to work in the, uh, the newly industrial north. Um, in the World Wars and in the aftermaths of the World Wars, there was a lot of movement, of course, and many people came to settle in Leeds then. Uh, and in the mid-20th century, we saw arrival of uh, numbers of people from the Indian subcontinent, from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, and also from the Caribbean, again coming to uh, provide cheap labor, essentially, uh, in post-war Britain. Um, but in the last 20, 30 years or so, there's been m much more variety, much more, um, much more range of, of, of places of, uh, of, of origin. People from Ethiopia, from Eritrea, Somalia, Congo, Iraq, Afghanistan, more recently from Libya, from Syria, where the political and economic situations forced people to uproot and to leave their homes. And we can see this in... Uh, the uh, current humanitarian crisis across Europe, and that will again cause more people to, um, to come to the UK. Uh, but also recently from Eastern European countries, such as the Czech Republic, from Slovakia, from Poland, associated with an expanding European Union. So we can see um, a large range of people, larger range of people from different places. In fact, you could say that Britain's urban centres now host multilingual and multicultural populations from potentially anywhere in the world. But the diversity extends beyond places of origin. Diversity uh, is uh, also there, evident in language background, in education background, in, in literacy background. Many people are coming with a school background, but many people are arriving without having f had foundational schooling as uh, as children, different socioeconomic statuses, of course, age ranges, gender differences, uh, uh, gen gender balances, and of course, motivations for moving are um, very varied and, and uh, a large range there. So, what does a super diverse area look like? 
This is a map of the uh, British Isles, and you can see Leeds there sort of in the middle. Leeds is exactly midway between London and Edinburgh. It's 200 miles in each direction. Um, and going to a different sort of map, th this map is from the, the census, the 2011 census, and um, it's the, the towns of West Yorkshire, uh, Bradford and Leeds, and uh, smaller towns of Wakefield and Dewsbury, Halifax, Huddersfield, and, uh, and Keithley surrounding that area. Um, but the darker the shading on this map, uh, the, um, the, 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 the higher the percentage of respondents claiming English as not a first, the main language. So the darker the shading on the map, the higher the number of respondents claiming a language other than English as their main language, according to the 2011 census. And this is homing in now on Leeds. And uh, as you can see, parts of our ward, our ward, Hare Hills, where we do our work, are shaded uh, a sort of dark red, indicating that 40% plus people in those areas uh, are claiming a language that's other than English in, in, uh, in the census in 2011. 2011 was the first time in, in the UK that the, uh, the census had had a question about language. It wasn't a particularly informative one, but it does allow us to, to look, at, uh, look at things in a fairly sort of uh, broad brush way. And uh, focusing in on, on Hare Hills there, we can see that even on a, on a street by street level, um, things are, um, well, we get a sense of, of the, uh, the diversity of the area through uh, uh, an idea that um, linguistic diversity is, is, uh, is very obvious. Um, in our project, the Tealang project, we're drawing upon linguistic landscape research. And uh, it was really interesting to see some other work on linguistic landscapes in, in, in India at the conference. And uh, really, uh, um, exciting to see the beginnings of such work going on. Um, so exploring the neighbourhoods um, and the streetscapes of our area, um, we're documenting the visual evidence of multilingualism and the written translanguaging and its emergence in time using photographs of shops, of signage and shop fronts. We're looking at the uneven distribution of multilingual texts across the neighbourhood streetscapes and we're bringing in an ethnographic dimension to this work as well, exploring the potential of ethnographic observation of small businesses, small business users, their customers, their owners, the service users, uh, in order to discover the details of everyday life behind the linguistic landscape, which I think is an important aspect of such research. So, an early stage of our Tealang research in Leeds involved documenting the linguistic landscape in three areas, in three neighbourhoods of Hare Hills, um, possibly about uh, half a mile to a mile apart, very, very close to one another. Um, the first area, neighbourhood one, is, uh, is the Round Hay Road. Um, the Round Hay Road is a super diverse globalised corridor. It's a major thoroughfare. It's an arterial road that runs through the middle of Hare Hills. And the shopping opportunities there attract visitors from across the city and, and beyond. People from other parts of Leeds go to Hare Hills to do their shopping, their socialising and so on. And English here seems to act as a lingua franca. Um, there's evidence on Hare Hills, on Round Hay Road, of the affluence and aspiration of longer standing residents. And this is displayed in the availability of, of luxury goods and, and, and services. So it's uh, not, it's, in some senses, it's quite a wealthy area. And historically, the linguistic landscape of the Round Hay Road seems to represent quite an advanced stage in the evolution of a migrant ecology. Two communities, Pakistani and Bangladeshi, uh, have settled in the neighbourhood from quite a long time ago, uh, and they've become home and property owners. And other people from these communities and from other communities who arrived at the same time have migrated to more affluent areas of the cities. Uh, but these groups, however, are still represented in Hare Hills by, by businessmen, 
and women and members of professions, health, law, education, charities, advocacy groups, and so on, uh, as well as by a large number of, of, uh, of consumers. So uh, an optician who's based in Hare Hills, clearly from a, um, a migrant background, um, these uh, signs uh, are for offices of solicitors, of accountants, um, at, on the corner of Round Hay Road. And um, as you can see, they're, um, they're monolingual. The signage is monolingual. The, uh, the businesses are owned and run by migrants and the children of migrants from Pakistan and Bangladesh. But there's no mention of the family names on these signs here. The second neighborhood, um, Hare Hills Lane, which runs up from Round Hay Road, it's a main road which takes us more towards the, um, the, the, the down market periphery of, of Hare Hills. It's, uh, it's a poorer area, a migrant area at a much earlier stage of development. A high street along which shops spring up to cater for specific categories of uh, more recent arrivals, um, among them EU migrants, asylum seekers, refugees, uh, many people arriving with little or nothing and who are sort of struggling to equip themselves with uh, with the basics of survival. And um, the shops sort of reflect this. Um, sorts of things that you see along uh, Hell's Lane. The new groups that have arrived recently are, are, are more numerous. There are more, more different groups, um, but they're smaller. So there's sort of less cohesion in uh, in, in Hare Hills right now. Um, but like the first migrants from Asia in the mid 20th century, uh, they are many, in many cases single and male. And these streetscapes would be very familiar by most, uh, for most people in the UK, I'm sure. Uh, the um, almost ubiquitous Polish shop and signage in, in Polish here uh, but we are observing the trend towards the dominance of English as a lingua franca in the signage in shops in this area. And this is happening as the range of expert languages increases and the need for one lingua franca becomes more um, correspondingly more obvious to, uh, to pragmatic shopkeepers. So clearly catering for a, 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 a migrant clientele, but the signage is all in English. And in the third area, this is a much smaller, a much uh, a back street uh, niche environment inhabited almost exclusively by Kurds, uh, Somalis, and Eritreans. Uh, here, the linguistic landscapes are more visibly multilingual and perhaps reflect what might have been what it might have looked like in, in the first place in Hare Hills back in the 1960s. So uh, this is uh, uh, an aerial view of, uh, of Hare Hills and, and Cherry Row, homing in on the little triangle of shops that's uh, to the left of the screen there. So this is where the, um, this is where the customers live, and these are the, uh, the shops themselves. And as I say, multilingualism here is much more visible because a smaller number of expert languages used means that writers of the signs can use languages other than English. The need for English as a lingua franca is not so pressing. And also Cherry Row is home to much more recent arrivals, uh, people who's, who might not have the competence in English literacy of more established migrants and for whom the need for uh, signage in, uh, in an expert language is, uh, is more obvious. So the contact. Oops. My mistake. The, contact, the concept of super diversity. What does the concept of super diversity add to our understanding and our theorizing. Why can't these neighborhoods in Hare Hill simply be described as very diverse? And I think that it's uh, perhaps, as Blomart and Rampton suggest in the quote that I put up earlier on, perhaps it's uh, 
um, a defining characteristic of a super diverse urban area is its unpredictability. So the, unpredictab the predictability of the category migrant has disappeared. And I think there are clear implications here for language policy and language planning. But although the linguistic landscapes of Hare Hills suggest subtlety and great complexity, this complexity does appear to be patterned in some ways. It's not as predictable as it's not as unpredictable as it might seem at first sight. This patterning can't easily be identified through census accounts of language and through counting of languages, and it only really reveals itself on close examination. And this points to uh, linguistic ethnography as an appropriate research approach for the study of linguistic diversity in super diverse urban spaces. So, because of our linguistic ethnographic research, we know now exactly where in Hare Hills we're most likely to find the shops and the services and the businesses catering for the more affluent and more established migrants, for example, and likewise where to find ones responding to the demands of those who are arriving more recently and who've got less uh, behind them whose uh, lives are more precarious. The unpredictability perhaps lies also in how the individuals in Hare Hills align or potentially align. Who teams up with whom and for what purpose? And the stories that we uncover behind the signs start to tell us how new ethnic alignments are made. So we find an Afro-Caribbean barber who is employing young Ghanaian and Tanzanian assistants in his shop. We find a Kurdish man and his Polish wife who are running an Eastern European food store. We find an Afghani refugee and his Slovak Roma, sorry, it's not a Czech wife, a Slovak Roma wife, who are forming a partnership with Pakistani entrepreneurs to run a pet shop, a clothes outlet, and an internet cafe. Actually, in series, the pet shop closed down and reopened as a clothes outlet and then a, an internet cafe, etc. But, I mean, extraordinarily complex, but beneath the complexity, there is again patterning. And it seems clear, for example, that the business relationships are based on a shared language. For example, the Afro-Caribbeans and the Africans speak English. The Afghan and the Pakistani speak Urdu. The reasons for the marital relationships, the Afghan and the Slovak Roma woman, the Kurdish man and the Polish woman, are less clear. But I think there are, you know, there are reasons that we can identify here why such patterns are, are emerging. But we are only scratching the surface. You, you, you have to go a, a long way down. So the contact zone, turning to the idea of the contact zone. Interactions increasingly take place in what Mary Louise Pratt, at the beginning of the 1990s, referred to as contact zones. Often today, virtual contact zones. Um, between speakers of different origins. The contact zones are a challenge to the established sociolinguistic notion of a speech community. And there's her quote there. Uh, the contact zone, in, it's intended in part to contrast with the ideas of community that underlie much of the thinking about language, communication and culture that gets done in the academy. Languages were seen as living in speech communities and these tended to be theorized as discrete self-defined, coherent entities held together by a homogenous competence or grammar shared identically and equally between all members. And today, language has been de-territorialized as diasporic communities interact with one another in the contact zone. Many sociolinguists of mobility including members of the Tlang team, align with a view of fluid or dynamic bilingualism and multilingualism known as translanguaging, appropriate for multilingual societies. And it's a term that's been used often in this conference. A lot of people are picking up on the notion of translanguaging. The starting point of uh, translanguaging is, is to remind us that separate, named, autonomous languages are societally constructed. And that is to say, while language is a biological endowment, individual, discrete, autonomous languages 
uh, social conventions. And rather than a traditional view of bilingualism resting on two languages with two separate linguistic systems, an L1 and an L2, there is but one linguistic system with features that are integrated throughout. When people translanguage, they sometimes use these features which align with societal constructions of a language, but often they use them differently. And the quote there from Li Wei and Ophelia Garcia in their recent book, instead, it connotes one linguistic system with features that are most often practiced according to societally constructed constructed and controlled languages, but at other times producing new practices. And the, um, the diagram there is adapted from uh, Garcia and Li Wei's book, which uh, contrasts a traditional view of bilingualism with an L1 and an L2, perhaps interacting in some ways, but the, uh, the notion of translanguaging suggests a much more bi uh, dynamic idea of but one system with features uh, uh, a repertoire with features that are recognizably from different, uh, from different languages, but are used, uh, are drawn upon as the context demands uh, by, and, and as, as uh, according to the competence of the users. And examples of this from, from our work. Um, multilingualism and translingual practices are clearly commonplace in all domains of life in contemporary urban spaces. And these examples come from the first of our field work phase, phases on the Tilang project. Um, the examples uh, are from the work that we did by following a community interpreter, Susanna. Susanna is the Z in this extract. Uh, Susanna um, came to Leeds in her early 20s, about 15 or 16 years ago, and she now works as a freelance community interpreter, doing work for the local council, often working with uh, Slovak and Czech Roma migrants uh, in various offices and spaces around Leeds. Um, so as a community interpreter, she translanguages uh, all the time. Um, it's clearly a bread and butter activity for her. Uh, so this uh, example here um, is a sort of, well, it demonstrates the sort of basic mediated uh, structure of mediated interaction. M here is the advocate. Z is Susanna, the interpreter. N is the client. So M, who doesn't share a language with N, communicates with N by means of Z, who shares both M and N's languages. And so M asks a question, which Z interprets in what's conventionally known as Czech, but the key bureaucratic lexis is in English, so there is some interlingual translanguaging going on here. Um, N replies, and Z relays her answer in English. And in the home, because we're fortunate enough to be able to follow Susanna into her home spaces as well, well, we gave her the recorder and she took the recordings, um, but the talk in Susanna, Susanna's home is mainly about day-to-day -day family concerns. Now, Susanna typically selects features from her multilingual repertoire that are associated with Czech, but in situations of urgency, when she needs to get a quick answer, or when speaking about institutions like school, she'll select features associated with the language that's dominant in society, and that with which her children have greater competence, which is, uh, which is English. The conversation, a, a good deal of the general conversation in Susanna's family um, is on the topic of language and on multilingualism itself. And in, this is an episode that's, that's full of humor. Uh, and Zed, Susanna, is prompting one of her daughters. Her daughters are R and T, and we're not quite sure which ones are, are actually talking at some points here. Um, the, she's prompting one of her daughters to say how good her spaghetti carbonara was in a, in a number of, of European languages. 
Now, I have a recording of this, and, which I'd like to play you, and, and um, if it works, we will be able to listen to them. So let's find out whether this, this will work. Possibly not. No. <laughs> it's on. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> Řekněte mi, jak vám chutná ty domáčka, protože co jsem poprvé dělal, to se jmenuje Carbonara. Jak vám to chutná? Já jsem tady sem řekl. Tady jsem 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 řekl. Tady Je baguette. Les spaghetti et beau. Beau. A španělsky? Gusta. 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 A spaghetti jsou dobré, jak to řeknu? Mi gusta un spaghetti. Ah. Marshmallows un s'il vous plaît. So, <laughs> I think there's, there's an awful lot you could say about this extract, but uh, um, we, we can see that uh, Susanna's responding to her, her daughter's claim in German that that is, is, that is sehr gut, ja, prompting her to repeat this in French and then in Spanish in a very sort of playful way. Um, but even as the family are talking about and playing with a range of features from different societally recognized languages, there's very fluid movement between them, and, and clearly between Czech and, and English, which are the principal, uh, the, which dominate in, in the household. They're drawing upon features of a multilingual repertoire, in some senses, to get things done. And in their online interactions, and this is... Um, this is the example that I showed you earlier on. We can see very much the same sort of uh, the same sort of thing, um, and I'd suggest that uh, the prevalence of uh, translanguaging online and the very observable translanguaging that goes on online uh, might be related to the idea that language in, is detached in some senses from its geographical anchorings and uh, not here maybe because this is SMS texting that's all happening in Leeds but in maybe in the transnational spaces of the internet where language is, is, is uh, no longer so as firmly located in a geographical space, we can see more fluid movement between languages, more translanguaging. Um, I thought I would put in just one example from, uh, uh, from, from India. So I've slipped in an example from, from Gujarat. In fact, it's uh, English and, and Hindi translanguaging, but this is a, uh, uh, a text message um, between, well, from one student to another. And uh, as you can see, there's, uh, there's fluid movement between English and Hindi, but also between uh, the, the different uh, sort of registers of, of English. There's, uh, there's an internet use there, the letter U for, uh, for Y-O-U-U, and so on. But in sum... Translanguaging as multilingual language and literacy practice is routine. It's unremarkable in daily life, in interaction at home and at work, in the written environment, but it's neglected and it's sometimes denied in educational contexts and certainly in policy circles. And that's where I'll uh, turn to now. Um, and you could say, so far, so familiar. But I'll end by drawing attention to what is probably another familiar truth, that national policy responses to the dynamic diversity associated with movement and mobility in our globalizing world are uneven and are contradictory. For example, in my own area and back home in the UK, uh, in adult language education, we frequently hear in public and political rhetoric for calls for migrants to speak our language, often in the name of national unity. And I'm sure there are analogies, uh, you can think of analogies where, where you are, where you're based. 
And the discourse that prompts a politician to insist that somebody speaks English, for example, is informed by deeply entrenched language ideologies, for, uh, which is to say beliefs, feelings, and conceptions about language structure and use, which often index the political interests of individual speakers, of ethnic and other interest groups, and of nation states. The ideology of a standard language, or a small number of standard languages, that should be used in the public and even the private sphere across a country is a particularly well-established one. This one nation, one language ideology is interlaced with other beliefs about national identity. For example, the notion that the nation state should be as homogenous as possible. And a dimension of that homogeneity is monolingualism or in some cases, an official state bilingualism or official state trilingualism. So while multilingualism and translanguaging are the norm on the ground, monolingualism is hegemonic. That is to say, there's a common sense notion that one language, or as I say, a small number of official languages, stands above all others as having a particular status as the standard language of the country. And monolingualist policies resonate with common sense understandings of the standard language as the unifying glue of a nation, and what holds a nation together. But the mobility of contemporary globalization presents something of a challenge to the idea of the nation as a unified entity. So the imagined homogeneity of a nation or a state, in linguistic terms, in the center there, is maintained by national policy and political discourse, but is challenged by mobility and diversity, including linguistic diversity. And I'm going to uh, end by um, giving you some examples of what I'm talking about by monolingualist political discourse. Um, these examples are from former and current uh, politicians in the UK. So going back a few years, our um, former and much loved Prime Minister, Tony Blair, talking about how uh, um, he was worried because of people who have been in the UK for a long time and still don't talk English. And he's worried because it indicates a separateness that might be unhealthy. More recently, our current and much loved Prime Minister, uh, David Cameron talking about how, how people who don't speak English cause dis discomfort and disjointedness in their own neighborhoods. Uh, Nigel Farage is the leader of the populist extreme right wing UKIP party, the UK Independence Party, and he's talking here uh, he's describing a train ride he took in London where uh, he couldn't hear English being spoken until he got to Grove Park. Does that make me feel slightly awkward? Yes, it does. So the idea amongst these senior politicians that English makes them feel awkward, uncomfortable. Uh, Boris Johnson, a um, uh, very high profile politician, currently mayor of London, um, talks about how uh, he doesn't want to be hostile to speakers of other languages. Other languages are beautiful things, but this is a country that happens to speak English. Okay, so Blair and Cameron seem to be associating uh, a lack of English with a breakdown in social cohesion. There's also a hint that English is implicated in, in, uh, in religious extremism and also in terrorism. Uh, Tony Blair, the top left-hand um, quote, was speaking in the immediate aftermath of the 2005 bombings in London, 7th of July 2005. Uh, bombings, a terrorist atrocity that was carried out by third-generation migrants who were very competent in English because they'd been using it all their lives. Nothing to do with English. Um, but they're associating linking English in political rhetoric with extremism and, and, uh, and terrorism. Uh, Nigel Farage, top right, um, betray a simple xenophobia. He's talking 
is indexing the unreasoned fear of that which is foreign or strange. And Boris Johnson at the bottom there seems to be denying multilingualism altogether. I'm going to end with some questions, by posing some questions. Questions relating to my talk, which I think would be useful to consider in relation to contexts which you're familiar with. Uh, we can use the last few minutes, I'm not sure how many minutes we have, Devanjan. We can use the first, last few minutes to discuss these, and of course, anything else that uh, you'd like to comment on or that you'd like me to clarify from my talk. Uh, but at that point, I will stop. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, James. That was a really stimulating start to day three. Uh, I'm sure members in the audience are bursting to ask James' question. There, Bonnie. Thank you very much, James. That was just wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm just intrigued about this translanguaging, and there was some data then, and as, I, as it flashed through, I had a, a thought, and I wanted to run it by you. I found it interesting that with Susanna, although she was using um, uh, co common languages, when she actually spoke about key points like uh, housing, council tax, she used English terms, embedded those terms within the other language. So I thought, I wonder, is that a trend, perhaps that a kind of scaffolding, that when there's a key term, you use it because that is kind of common, you know, across different languages and also important for, for the client to understand in, in, the, in English. So, uh, did, did, you, did you see that? I thought that was quite yes. fascinating. Yes, Thank I, you. I, I won't, well, maybe I will go back to it. It's, uh, it's not very far back there. Yeah, so what's going on here, I think, this is the, this is the, the, the slide that Bonnie was referring to. Um, Susanna is using, uh, using uh, Czech to talk to N, who is a Czech Roma migrant who's moved to the UK fairly recently, is negotiating the benefits system, which is extraordinarily complex, massively bureaucratic, and very, very hard to uh, negotiate. So what somebody like N does is to go along to a, a a, a, a charity which uh, provides advocacy and support for migrants. So M is a volunteer advocate, but M, of course, doesn't speak Czech or Slovak, uh, but Susanna does. So they bring, the charity brings Susanna in to work as the interpreter in this context. Uh, but the terms council tax and how, well, housing may be less so, but certainly council tax does not have an easy and an easily translatable equivalent in Czech and Slovak. So the English term, the conventional English term, becomes used in common discourse, in, uh, in interaction which might be predominantly in Czech. But yes, you have these bureaucratic terms that are embedded within the discourse. And it's, it's similar, it works in similar ways in, in the house, in the home as well. We don't have an example here, but when she's talking to her daughters, it tends to slip into English if they're talking about the school and the curriculum and assessment and that sort of thing. But it's, um, uh, the, I think the point about the, 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 the home is, is the, 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 the bounds of, or the ties of language are, are untied. The, 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 the people, the individual family members are, are sort of released from, the, from the, the binds that tie them to particular uh, societally conventionalized languages in, in the public sphere. So they're not under an obligation to speak one or the other. But thank you for that. I'll go back to, back to the questions. There's a question from Ajit. Uh, the, the idea that uh, a bilingual 
or a mono, multilingual person is uh, X number of monolinguals put together has been rejected for quite some time. Uh, Grossian talked about uh, bilingualism being the first language and some of us have written about multilingualism being the first language. But the problem arises when you look at uh, the processes of acquisition. Uh, the question that is uh, important to, to find an answer to is uh, whether in a translanguaging kind of a situation, uh, children acquire independent linguistic systems or do they acquire a composite translanguaging system. The problem is more evident when you look at uh, the formal uh, use of languages and also written textual representation of languages where translanguaging practices are not completely absent but they tend to disappear, you know, tend to be, become minimized. So in view of that, how would one uh, characterize translanguaging except as a practice imbibed from the daily use rather than being a mental representation? Being a mental I think with tra translanguaging, um, the more you observe it, the more it appears to be, and I, I agree, I think that there needs to be more empirical and also psycholinguistic work, but I think recent work by um, people like Bialystok and, and colleagues points to the, uh, the idea that we're not dealing with separate or perhaps separate and interacting linguistic systems, perhaps we're dealing with one linguistic system. And I think the more, you, the more data you uh, look at and the more you observe translingual practices in informal contexts, the more it, it seems to be that there is an underlying, ling one underlying system um, from a, a repertoire, if you like, from which um, people draw features and use and deploy features according to the contingencies of that particular context. Many contexts and many situations where we observe language use, the requirement is to stay within one conventionally recognized language. Um, language, is, is, uh, it, it, language use is controlled in, in, many, in many contexts, in many situations. You can still see in further education colleges in the UK, you can still see signs on the wall which, says, which say English only to be spoken in this classroom. Not quite as extreme as the examples from, uh, from yesterday, but, but a similar policing of language. So in, the, in public contexts and in the public sphere, it's more likely that language use is going to, going to look as if it's associated with this conventionally recognized language or that one. In informal context, and I think setting and context are very important here, there is much more fluidity, there's much more movement between languages, which suggests to me, but I'm, I, I think that you're right, I think more needs to be done, that there is just but one underlying system with features from many different languages. Thank you. There's a question at the back, Anupama. Ah, yeah, and then you. Yes. These are the Thank last two questions. Thank, yeah. Thank you, James. That was a really interesting um, presentation. I'm Nicola McCartney from New Zealand, and um, I work in adult literacy, especially in the workplaces, and I can see how translanguaging could be really effective to be um, looked at in terms of um, literacy skill development in the workplace. I'm wondering if you have any examples of effective policy and implementation in terms of um, workplace literacy practices. Um, I think that um, I'd, I'd like to be able to reel off a, a, a list of studies that, uh, <laughs> that, that yes, uh, here are some very effective uh, multilingual literacy policies for workplaces, but I can't. Um, 
What I would say is that there's a sort of growing recognition within education and beyond that um, policy needs to recognize the reality of, uh, of multilingualism on the ground. And it's very gratifying to hear um, at this conference and also recently I was in the United States that this recognition is appearing at, at policy levels. Um, <coughs> Ajit was telling me about ORISA, where, where a multilingual language policy is, uh, is sort of, it's there in, in, in state policy, and if, if yet to sort of trickle down to the uh, to, to classroom level. Uh, in Minnesota, in the United States, there is uh, now um, a multilingual uh, education policy in secondary schools and in further, and um, uh, and vocational education. So that's the closest I can get there. The teachers are under an obligation to bring in students, uh, expert languages, into, into pedagogy in secondary and further education in the state of Minnesota. The, as specific as I can get, I'm afraid. Thank you. No, we have time for one last question there. Uh, yeah. Good morning. My name is Deitri. I'm from Mauritius. So thank you very much for your talk. I'm going to take you back to that slide on council tax and housing, if that's okay with you. Yes. I was a bit uncomfortable with the example because I, uh, you mentioned that this was an example of interlingual translanguaging. For many of us who work within, in the field of language contact, we know that translanguaging or any other kind of uh, code switching, for that matter, implies that uh, there is a choice for the multilinguals and they can take from multiple uh, linguistic repertoires and they can mix and match to, 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 to give us an output. In the case of your informants there, what I would see is a case of lexical gap that there is no equivalent in their uh, original language, so they have no other choice but to use council tax and uh, uh, housing or even the word mail in your other examples. So how far is that pragmatically consequential? Because if there is lexical gap, then it means that you have no other option but to use those terms, and it means there's no translanguaging taking place. So. For me, that is an example that is not very appropriate, so I would like you to react to that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for that. I, th I think you're, you're right about the, um, the notion of, of the, um, the idea that there's no appropriate term to use. But I, I, I would also, I'd also say that um, you know, translanguaging is, is, it's not, it doesn't necessarily work all the time. Um, it's not necessarily something that is an effective uh, strategy. Sometimes it leads us into all sorts of problems, and there are there are other examples that I might I, I might use where the um, where the, the client has tried to use uh, what they what they suppose is is the uh, the correct term in, in English, where there is a, a, a Czech or Slovak equivalent, but it's actually been the wrong term, and it's it's led to all sorts of difficulties later on. But I, I take your point, and, and I, but I would also say that the, uh, a, a strict uh, definition of translanguaging is, is still up for grabs. It's, it's, uh, it's a contested term, uh, and it's, it's not, there, there isn't one settled definition. But thank you. Thank you very much, James, for that wonderful plenary session. Um, we have a little sort of memento for you.